Welcome to Word Pictures, a program of discussion and discovery. We examine the stories, events, and persons as described in the Word Pictures, presented in the 66 books of Scripture we know as the Word of God. But what kind of God is pictured here? By reading these stories, some become fearful, others adore. Yet others are just confused. Come, let us see for ourselves in an unrehearsed, no question barred discussion with people just like you as we search for the God of these stories. What picture of God will emerge for you? Let's join the discussion right now. Welcome to our discussion. We're so glad that you have joined us. As we have been working our way through the Bible relatively quickly, we have come to the book of the Philippians, the letter to the Philippian church. And uh, it is just full of interesting things. It seems as you look at the Gospels and at Paul's writings that the big issue was to make Jesus real, to make his life and death real to the Jews and real to the Gentiles. Let's go to the second chapter of the book of Philippians and the fifth verse. And here is another one of those real issues about Jesus. And it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. What a story in just a few words mm -hmm. of the whole plan of salvation, yep. which is what they seemed to, as a unit, the Bible writers wanted to make that point. Yes. How does it fit into that culture? Well, I think it fits very well. And, and this is one of four passages that we'll look at in a few moments that talk about the nature of Christ and what he came to accomplish and so forth. Um, but I would like to back up now a moment and say, okay, how does this fit into the book of Philippians? Uh, Philippi was a very interesting uh, place for a number of reasons. Uh, the ancient city of Philipp Philippi was located in the Roman province of Macedonia. <coughs> Remember, the Macedonia is the area, northern area of what we call Greece today. And Paul went there right after he had been at Troas and he received that message come over into Macedonia to help us. He presumably took a boat or something of that nature, traveled across to a small island, then on to Neapolis, which has a different name now, and then on to Philippi. And this was his real introduction to Europe. And he, this was a big deal. Completely new territory. No Christians had entered this era territory as far as you know before that. And so Paul, even when it came to Sabbath, as far as he could find, there, were no, there was no Jewish synagogue at Philippi. Uh, so he went down to the river. And lo and behold, there by the river were a few Jews and some women uh, worshiping. And Paul spoke to them and very quickly, one by the name of Lydia, was convinced to become a Christian after hearing Paul had to say and so forth. And she apparently was a very wealthy woman, invited Paul and all his entourage over to her place to stay as long as they were in Philippi to do their work there. So that's the introduction of Paul to Philippi. The, the, the city of Philippi was named for whom? Can I yeah. have a, um, a question? Are you saying that Paul went there when there was no church there? No. That, so why did he go there? Because they, someone said they needed a church there? In a vision, in a vision, he received the message at Troas come over into Macedonia and help us. 
Paul saw it in vision, and he went over there, and this was the first city he went to. And okay, this, and he was led to this little group, and Lydia happened to be there that yeah. had the, mm -hmm. the means to maybe help start a church. Right. And, and it's not that there were, there was no church there, it was There was not no even Jews. a synagogue. No. There a few synagogue, a few Jews out there worshiping by the river, but not even. See, the Jews had a ruling that if there were ten families, you were supposed to establish a synagogue. So, there was no synagogue in Philippi, so presumably, there weren't even ten families in this but, city. But this little knot of people down there at the river, there were some Jews. Some Jews, which is quite fortuitous, I would say. Yes. Was Lydia a Jew? No. Lydia was a Gentile. But she was with this group of Jews? Apparently either, I don't know whether she was worshiping with them or she just happened to be nearby, but she heard Paul pre preaching and she was convinced. In answer to your last question, <coughs> was it named after Philip, the father of Alexander the Great? Yes. And we're going to find out that we've already talked about the Thessalonians, the letter to the Thessalonians. Thessalonica is where Paul went next in his journeys, if you go back to the book of Acts, and Thessalonica was named after Alexander the Great's sister. So Alexandria, of course, was named after, there were several Alexandrias named after him, so every member of the family basically had cities named after them. Now in Thessalonica, was there a church, or was this a completely... This was brand new territory, brand new Not, territory. no Christian, nothing as far as he could tell, no. So. God knows the hearts of the people yep. in those cities and knew that a church would succeed if established there. Yes. Well, he not only knows the hearts of the people in a community, he knows that there's always people there. There's always an open heart in every community. Well, and, and let's talk about <coughs> Philippi a little bit now. Philippi was a very interesting city. It's located just at the, just at the pass. There's a, si a row of mountains that comes down toward the Aegean Sea, and then there's a pass there, and it's the only easy place to get through from Europe to, to Asia, mm. Turkey being in Asia. So it was a very important city. It was important for some other reasons as well, and that's what, that uh, about in the 40s BC, uh, Octavius and, uh, well, the man who came, came to be known as, as Caesar Augustus, his original name was Caius Octavius Caipius, um, and, and his associates uh, actually won a series of battles against uh, Brutus and Anthony, and thus basically paved the way for, for, for Octavius to become the future emperor. And, and in the process, they felt, he apparently felt that the Philippians had helped him in that process, and he therefore declared Philippi a Roman colony. Now, a colony, a Roman colony is not just, you know, an outpost somewhere way off in the, in the sticks. In those days, a Roman colony meant a little piece of Rome, literally. So the government at Philippi was Roman. The language of government was Roman, even though all the local people spoke Greek. And remember, in those days, Greek was considered to be the language of the sophisticated people. But since these were, these were soldiers that had worked for 21 years for the Roman army, and they officially earned their retirement, and a whole group of them were sent here they in Philippi, and now they were operating the government. They were in charge of the city of Philippi. So it was it, Roman dress, Roman language, Roman government. Um, was, was Roman considered to be sophisticated also like Greek, or was, did the Greek no. feel that Roman was a, a lower... Now remember, the, the language is actually called Latin. Latin. Yeah, the language from Rome. But it was really looked down upon by the Greeks. Yeah. And not many people spoke it in those early days. And what else do we know about what happened there? Well, um, because they were the Roman city, when Paul got there, remember, he was preaching, and who started following him around? Do you remember? It was the demon-possessed woman? The demon-possessed woman, and she was un under the control of several men who made their money by having her so, so, supposedly predict the future and all this kind of stuff. 
and Paul was concerned. I mean, think about someone like that falling around. What, what, what did she say? What was it that she kept announcing? These are the messengers of the Most High God. Now, if you're known as a demon-possessed woman, and you're traveling all over town, everybody knows you, and all of a sudden you announce, here are the messengers of the Most High God, what's going to be likely the implication? That you're mixed up with them. That you're mixed up with that same, same bunch. <laughs> that maybe they're also part of this demon-possessed crowd, whatever. And Paul finally decided that was too much. We're not, going to, we're not going to allow this go on. He turned around and cast out the demon from this woman. Is that like someone in the church not being a proper church person and witnessing to church and uh, it's not a very good witness? Well, I mean, you can, you can look at that and, and interpret it however you like. Obviously, Paul was concerned that, that this woman was really distracting from the work that he'd been called to do. Now, Philippi was the only Roman colony in all of Macedonia at that point in time. Do we have a history of what happened to that woman? No, we don't. No, no. Nothing beyond what you already know. Nothing, nothing said she was converted. It was this casting out of the demon was a matter of convenience in the gospel. Well. It seems kind of strange, but what, well, not really, you know. If you, so what happened? Tell the demon to well, you know, if, bug if, off. If you're a lady who <clears throat> is demon possessed, maybe like Mary Magdalene, and you are cleansed of the demon and you're restored to your normal mind, it seems to me that you would want to investigate and maybe go to this church yeah. or something. So she, she might have been thankful that she was uh, brought to uh, wholeness yeah. in her mind. But the owners who've been manipulating her were not happy at all. What did they do? They stirred up a riot among the you know, rabble of the city and they started to attack Paul and, and Silas and they arranged for them to be thrown into prison. Mm -hmm. And they were put in the dungeon, the, 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 the most locked, most powerful, most secure place in the prison. And after they had been beaten and so forth like this, they were put in this prison they apparently were lying flat on 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 um, con granite floor with their feet up in stocks. Imagine how comfortable that is after you've been beaten, you, you know, your back all flayed to, to pieces. Is this because they upset the economic order? This lady had been bringing lots of money into uh, a certain group of people, and so when you stop yeah. the money flow, people get kind of upset? Yes. Exactly. Well, I'm sure the anger was kind of enhanced by the spirits there, Yeah. too. So it, yeah, it was probably a little happy. more than usual. Yeah. So it took great um, faith on Paul's part when he was in this dungeon with his feet up in the air and locked in stocks to affirm in his mind that God had sent him here. Yeah. And what were they doing in the middle of the night? Singing. Singing. Paul and Silas were singing. What do you suppose kind of uh, singing where they were used to hearing out of that dungeon? Usually curses and swearing and <coughs> that kind of stuff. I mean, groaning. can you imagine singing Christian hymns coming out of the dungeon? People were completely shocked. And then what happened next? There was an earthquake. There was a big old earthquake. Now, and this is an unusual earthquake because what did it do? It opened the prison and undid the stocks. Mm-hmm. Yes. This would be an eye-opening earthquake. Now, you said that they were singing Christian hymns. Were there even Christian hymns? Were they singing Prob like Jewish hymns? Or? Probably, probably, maybe Christian modifications of Jewish hymns, which basically probably were the Psalms of the Old Testament. Okay. Since, we're, since we're in Philippians, it reminds me of chapter 2, verse 14, about this singing. Do everything without complaining mm -hmm. or arguing. Mm -hmm. so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be happy, be joyous. There was another scripture I was looking for in there that was maybe a little more appropriate, but... Yes, they, this is the most joyous of all of Paul's letters. He uses joy and happiness and so forth, I think it's 18 times in this little book. But now, just to get the background, so what happened in the middle of the night, the earthquake, and what resulted? Well, the jailer thought everybody was had escaped. escaped. You know, that's what 
they would expect him to do. And so he was about to kill himself because mm -hmm. if, under, under Roman law, if a jailer got rid or let the prisoners escape, it was his life that was at, at yeah. risk. They were very harsh, even if they were on guard duty, if they just fell asleep. My understanding is they would kill them. It's very interesting. Ellen White had some interesting touches to this story. She says the authorities from the city, the Romans, now remember, they're the ones in charge of the city. They had escorted Paul and, and Silas and put them in prison because, you know, they thought, we're not going to let any Jews. Of course, the idea was these people, these people were being accused of bringing in a new religion, okay? And so they said, okay, so they're on their way back home after they put them in prison, and they start hearing the true story of what these people had been doing, and the kind of messages being on. And they already had determined by the time they got home, you know, we really imprisoned a couple of innocent people. We'll just let them, we'll let them go free in the morning. And then there's an earthquake in the middle of the night, and Paul gets out and baptizes the jailer and his family. They become Christians and maybe some others with them. And then in the morning, what did the authorities say? <coughs> they sent this message, you know, let those guys go. What, what was Paul's response? How is it this didn't take a three-week evangelist? You, you put us in here, you come let us go. <laughs> and why did he say that? He wanted them to come in person uh, to... Um, so they'd have to show that they did something wrong and correct it. Okay, but there's a special reason. You're, you're absolutely right, but what was the key behind that? Rome, Paul, and Paul says, says, look, you people, you bunch of Romans, we are also Roman citizens. Mm. Oh, boy. And when they said that, the jailer, he was scared to death. And everybody else said, if you're Romans, boy, you can't be treated like this. this isn't the, and the Roman authorities came rushing out there. Can we help you? Can we you know, <laughs> escort you out of the... Why didn't he say something before? I, that's a question I wondered. Why he didn't say something sooner? And he may what, have, what, but they weren't listening. Maybe. What, 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 I mean, this is a pretty short three-week evangelistic series here, yeah. this conversion. What, what, is, what, what, is the, what is the requirement for becoming a Christian? Well... Paul writes back to them and say and talks about how he had instructed them pretty thoroughly. So, I mean, I, I, obviously we don't have recordings. I wish I had recording of what Paul said to them. I wish he'd written it all down in a book. We would be way ahead. We what do have, you mean by instruction? Well, he, he had a small group of people, a growing group of people, apparently. He probably talked to them during the day. He talked to them in the evening. He, it was his full-time job. And Paul and Timothy and Luke and and maybe and Silas, so there were several of them. But what, what specific do you think they talked about? I thought they, I think they talked about the life of Jesus and about Christianity, and also about how to act. They, they, I think they talked about the difference between Christianity and uh, and their pagan religions. I think that's probably what they really focused on. He says, "You have nothing to look forward to. What promise? We have a God who came down and, and was willing to do all of this." And now he's gone back to heaven. He's the creator of everything, and he's our friend. Well, you know, I mean, how can you argue with that? Isn't Paul an absolute expert in the Old Testament? Sure. And he could take the people through the Old Testament and show how Christ was foretold mm -hmm. and prophesied, and now how everything had just fallen into place. That would be quite fascinating for him. Mm -hmm. I know it was fascinating for me yeah. when I first heard it. But you know, before they came up and told him to let him go, the jailer wasn't really off the hook. I mean, they were out. They were, he was yeah. becoming a Christian, and still the, the sentence that he could get from his superiors were still there. It could still happen to him. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out that a couple of the people from this little small church of Philippi became later workers with Paul. So obviously he had a pretty big impact on those people he was working with. And um, he now is writing this letter several years later. And where is he writing from? Prison. Is Prison. Yeah. Quite a few. We suggested in our earlier discussion that he had written Ephesians and Colossians and Philemon. And then, and he sent those off with uh, Tychicus and Onesimus to those churches. And then 
he later, he says, I'm just about to be released from prison in the book of Philippi here, or Philippians, and he, he says, okay, and he sends another guy over there to, back to them saying, get ready, I'm coming, I, I'm going to get out of prison here. So this letter is to the church at Philippi after it had been established and Paul was in prison and he wrote a letter back to him. Right. Saying, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Or what does he say in the letter? This is about, this is about 10 years later, okay. approximately, 10 years later. And he wrote to them for a very specific reason. Do you remember what the specific reason was? Were they having a problem? No. That's one of the nice things about this letter. They weren't having a problem. How happy you make me and how proud I am of you. Mm -hmm. This, dear friends, is how you should stand firm in your life in the Lord. He was very happy with the success of this little church and these people. Wow. We have a smooth, well-run <coughs> operating church here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, not only that, but they were the only church that uh, had on several occasions actually gathered money and sent it to Paul to support him in his work. The several, only church. Several times, yes. Yeah. And this time they had actually sent someone with quite a bit of money to Paul, to, well, to find Paul in Rome in prison and give him money. And he was very thankful. And Lydia being a somewhat... Um, a businesswoman. A businesswoman and an affluent person. She was able to drop uh, a little extra in that purse. Yeah, and not only Lydia, probably several others in that, in that church were. Remember, this was a, and we didn't mention this, but Philippi had become famous back in the early days because there were gold and silver mines in the, in the mountain right, right behind um, Philippi. So it was a fairly wealthy church. I mean, it was a fairly wealthy city, and so we, we assumed that there was some fairly this, wealthy. So at the, this time at the, at the authorship of this letter, about 10 years later after Paul sat down there on the river and made mm -hmm. contact with these people, uh, any idea how many people this letter was addressed to? About how many were in the church? 25, 50? We don't know. We just don't know. You know, but this, this is really tells us that when God wants to move someplace to follow, even though it seems like nothing's going to happen because he knows the future, mm -hmm. this is going to be one of his solid churches uh, supporting his uh, apostle. Yeah. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be a whole lot easier to do what God wanted you to do in your ministry if he'd give you a vision. I, that just seems like, you know, Paul was so lucky here. He got this vision and, okay, go over here. Yeah. Instead of well, just guessing all the time. Well, you know, and I've <laughs> asked classes a number of times this question. Wouldn't it be nice to have maybe ten, even 10 minutes or maybe half an hour once a week to sit down with God or even one of God's angels, and, and talk with them, okay, these are the questions I have, could you please answer them, can't you show me the way, what, do you, what would you like me to do? That would be wonderful. What would be the problem with that? Not a blooming thing, sounds like a great idea to me. No, there's a, there's a serious <laughs> problem to that, what is it? Well, if you're alluding to perhaps giving us our own free will to make up our mind without necessarily too much outside input, Okay. We're um, still getting spiritual. Well, no, 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 you've forgotten about the great controversy. Please, folks, don't forget. It. Well, if, we, if God gave us a half an hour, the devil would absolutely demand that he have a half an hour. How would you like to spend half an hour with him? But you can have your half hour. You've got his word. He will speak to you. <laughs> you know, God says, I, I don't... I don't I, in fact, the reason he doesn't allow that kind of stuff is because he knows we would fall apart at well, this point in our history I'm, I'm, if, I'm, if we had that kind of, if the devil had that kind of influence on us. I'm, I'm puzzled by your, your last statement there. I mean, God came and he gave Paul a vision about going to Macedonia, so why wouldn't, following that logic, why wouldn't Satan come down and say, okay, uh, I deserve to some right. time to give him a vision. He, he, he did, through the lady and through the time in prison and so forth like this. Well, you know, we have what Paul had. We have a vision laid out for us. It's even in writing, and, mm -hmm. and it's a lady who told us how mm -hmm. we're supposed to negotiate. I yes. mean, what more do we want? Come on. Exactly. Uh, and if we'd have studied and we had been involved in the word that he left with us, we wouldn't have needed her. Yeah. 
And now that we've got her, what is our excuse now? Even less. <laughs> Speaking of, of visions, here's a solemn little vision. And it's quite a joyous thing, but it just doesn't sound that way when it's read. It's in the chapter 1, verse mm -hmm. 29. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to, but also to suffer for him. Mm -hmm. So that, to a lot of people, that doesn't sound joyous, but I mean, he's given us some type of a present there. Well, so, so we, we review very quickly why Paul wrote this letter. They had sent him money. He was very thankful for the money. He's writing a thank you note, number one. Uh, he had passed through Ephesus. We've already talked about his first coming to Ephesus. He'd passed through Ephesus, I mean, he passed through Philippi again uh, on his way from Ephesus to Corinth. Um, he wanted them to understand that he expected to get out of prison fairly, fairly soon, even though originally he was sent there with the idea that he would probably lose his head. Epaphroditus from Philippi had been very ill, but was now returning to Philippi with Paul's letter. And now, remember that Paul talks in this letter, we'll see it in a moment, how um, this guy had been very sick and almost they thought he was going to die, but God had given him back to them. And Paul says, I want you to know what his status is. Um, Paul recognized that there were some people trying to teach false doctrines in Philippi, so even though this is a nice little thank you note, he, he puts in some important points, uh, doctrinal points, and Norm read some of those to us, and we'll get to those in a moment. And he wanted to remind the, Philippi, the Philippians that his salvation comes through Jesus Christ and not through practicing Jewish ceremonies. So those are some of the obvious points that you can get from this letter. Um, if for him to say that, did some Jews trot over to Philippi yes. and start to say, uh, wait a minute, you have to be Jewish and then you can become Christian. Yeah. So they followed the, what did you call them, the, the Jews that did that? Judaizers? Judaizers. So the Judaizers even followed Paul yeah. to Philippi. Even though there were almost no Jews there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the questions that we need to just mention very briefly is, is there any, are there any attacks against Philipp Philippians, the book of Philippians? Do, do some scholars think it's not an authentic book of Paul? And the answer is virtually nobody. Nobody even questioned it until the 18th century when the time of higher criticism came up. But it's, this is one of the few books that there's almost no question about it. There are two uh, early church fathers, Ignatius of Antioch, who lived from AD 35, so he was, he was born the year Paul became a Christian, up to AD 107, and Polycarp, a famous Christian, he was born in AD 69, lived up to 155, and both of them clearly supported the authorship of Paul for, for this letter and a lot of others behind them. So nobody's really been able to raise any significant doubts about this being a letter from Paul. Hmm. So considering that history, is it any surprise that this is a, a happy letter? I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, one of the questions we need to talk about here, and we'll get to it in a moment, we have to take a break. Paul, what's Paul doing just to remind us What's he doing at this point when he's writing the letter? He's in prison. And he's probably shackled. He's probably handcuffed to a Roman soldier night and day. <coughs> what would you do for two years handcuffed to a Roman soldier night and day? We'll be right back.
Welcome. We're so glad you decided to stay by. We're talking about the little book of Philippians in among Paul's letters. It's down near the end, uh, historically, of Paul's letters. He's still got three or four still to go. But um, this little book has some real questions. And, and, and we ended up talking about uh, the fact that uh, Paul was a prisoner in Rome under house arrest when the Roman government decided to allow him to use his own money, and I suppose he probably got some money from people donated to him, to actually hire a house, but the Roman guard had to be, uh, you know, chained to him probably 24-7 to make sure he didn't escape. So what would it be like? Think first of all about, about Nero. What do we know about Nero? We don't need to review his whole life, but... Wasn't a very nice guy. He wasn't a very nice guy. He was a scoundrel. I remember just a horrible story. Was this him that he would take Christians, dead Christians, put their bodies around his patio and use them for torches, for lights, while they had a party? Was that Nero? I don't know. It could have been. That's about the kind of stuff he would do. Yeah. Killed his mother and oh, just all kinds of stuff. Just absolute awful guy. And he collected around him a bunch of people. He had sort of his private army that were his, his people that maintained law and order, you understand. Um, and, and Ellen White had these few words, and, and let me just read them to you. Nowhere could there exist an atmosphere more uncongenial to Christianity than in the Roman court. Nero seemed to have obliterated from his soul the last trace of the divine, and even of the human, and to bear the impress of Satan. His attendants and courtiers were in general of the same character as himself, fierce, debased, and corrupt. To all appearance, it would be impossible for Christianity to gain a foothold in the court and palace of Nero. Yet in this case, as in so many others, was proved the truth of Paul's assertion that the weapons of his warfare were mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. 2 Corinthians 10.4 even in Nero's household, trophies of the cross were won. From the vile attendants of a, <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, evil king were gained converts who became sons of God. These were not Christians secretly, but openly. They were not ashamed of their faith. And by what means was an entrance achieved and a firm footing gained for Christianity where even its admission seemed impossible? In his epistle to the Philippians, Paul ascribed to his own imprisonment his success in winning converts to the faith from Nero's household. Fearful lest it might be thought that his afflictions had impeded the progress of the gospel, he assured them, the Philippians, I would ye should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel, Philippians 1.12. And that's found in Acts of the Apostles, uh, the writings of Ellen White, pages 462 and 463. You, you try to imagine how that how that would take place. So he's thrown into prison. He ends up in Nero's place, thrown into prison, chained to a guard. Well, his only contact with all of that is, is that guard. Mm -hmm. So I imagine they have conversations. And where is mm -hmm. Paul going to take that conversation? Yeah. And he wins the respect of the guard. And yeah. the guard says, you know, I, I know somebody that needs to hear this. Why don't you, I'll bring so-and-so down here, and why don't you, we'll discuss that again. And it, and it grows from, from that. And and until he's got an audience in the prison listening to his message. And it's probably Paul's friends came as well. Hmm. And church members would come, and he would discuss it with them with an eye to the guard hmm. trained next door to him, I mean, trained attached to him there, basically. So these guys were getting... Probably every waking moment, every one of Paul's waking moments, they were hearing about the gospel. <laughs> when he wasn't preaching, he was singing. <laughs> you know, also God, it's just not plain old conversation. Like we could talk to a prison guard maybe all our life and nothing would happen. Mm -hmm. But when you're testifying of God, um, don't you get a um, inspirational conversation? You're able to talk like you can't talk. Uh, you haven't been able to talk on your own. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think Paul was very convincing in that he was infused with the Holy Spirit while Absolutely. he was doing this. Paul had some amazing stories to, yeah. to tell, you know, like 
By the way, you know why I came down here? Well, I got this dream. Uh, I was. Uh, what about I was, the Damascus Road? That's right. Uh, I, I I was like you. I I didn't believe in this uh, Christianity stuff, and one day, good grief, I was struck by lightning practically, and mm -hmm. and was blind, and and all of this stuff, and raised in uh, a culture that was. Uh, the origins of this, but we got it all confused, and and now I see it straight. And but what I'm saying is, if <coughs> I would say that to someone, they'd think I was loony. And so <laughs> he had a sense of credibility, and just in his personality and the way he said things, that they believed him. Oh, I bet you've got your own Macedonia and Macedonia, and yeah, I bet you've got people that give you credibility. No, but I mean like Paul, he, he just, uh, he was credible wherever he went. That has to be a gift from God. Well, I'm like you, I'm not sure I have it. <laughs> well, if Paul was one of the apostles, and if he had received the gift of the Holy Spirit, apparently that was a capacity to speak in any language fluently. And he probably spoke to these guards in, in Latin. Well, if Which, he was a Roman citizen. What? If he was a Roman citizen. Possible. Yeah. yeah. I think that would impress them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, here's somebody that came from way across the other side of the Mediterranean, you know, and here he is speaking fluent Latin to us. Mm -hmm. And treated them with respect. Yeah. Didn't spit mm -hmm. on them or... or yeah, exactly. Like had a reasonable tone mm -hmm. about him, Probably and yet he was willing to be imprisoned for his beliefs. Probably didn't even, uh, probably treated him better than the other guards treated, treated one another. Yeah. Well, one of the really major things in the book of Philippians is the passage that Norm read to us back at the beginning, found in chapter 2. I'm not going to read the whole passage over again, but look at verses 10 and 11. Philippians 2, 10 and 11. I hope you have your Bible handy. Look at this. Your, your version will be a little different wording than mine. Mine's the Good News Bible. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees. That's future, isn't it? Will fall on their knees, and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God, the Father. Where did Paul learn about that kind of stuff? Who are the people underneath, under the uh, earth? Under the earth? Well, that would be the, the, the world of the dead. Well, you don't talk to the dead. Come on. Well, so what, what's what's this about? It's a, it's the beings that are different than the ones that are above. There's beings above. There's beings below. Sure, when it's you all, die and you're naughty, you go to hell. Well, well, <laughs> Satan. How, how are these people who are dead going to? No, no, no you're not talking about them. You're talking okay. about Satan and his demons. Where okay, are they? On. You say they're coming from oh, oh, heaven? Oh, 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 oh. No, they're coming from below. Hold on, before we go too far, it says, if you understand the Hebrew idiom here, Paul is thinking in terms of Hebrew, Aramaic, whatever, rather than Greek. He's saying every being in the universe is going to be bowing down, including Satan, and saying God was right. Everybody now, above, everybody below. Fine. That's okay. what we're saying. Okay, well, just hold on. There's, there's something important about this. We need to figure out when that did happen or will happen. Because that's going to help us to understand who's going to be there. That's a will happen. That's a will happen. Okay, Paul, when will it happen? Paul read about that in Revelation. The third Revelation <laughs> not been written yet. That'll be at the third coming. The only time that could happen, by the way, uh, in case you're wondering, that Paul had a hint of that in the Old Testament. Isaiah 45, 23 has almost these same words. Isaiah 45, 23. And Paul is saying the time is going to come when God is going to be totally and completely vindicated in what he has done. So much so that even the devil himself is going to be down on his knees and say, yes, God, you did it right. Now, what's it going to take to accomplish that? <coughs> Excuse me. How, how, a lot of resurrections. A lot of resurrections. Everybody who has ever been alive is going to be alive at the same time at the third coming. It's going to have to be so clear and mm -hmm. so solid in its evidence so convincing. that even if you are totally against it, you're going to have to admit that Christ is Lord. Mm -hmm. There have to be a lot of people. Really I can admit. hear it says you'll admit willingly or even if you were unwilling, you'd have to admit it. Mm -hmm. 
So there's kind of come a day when, when the evidence is so clear. So when is that day in there's, Revelation? There's also but there's a difference between admitting and being convinced. Yeah, sure. They're well, not I mean, convinced. They're just admitting. Wait a well, how, how well, they're going to be convinced, and they're going to have to. Admit. I'm convinced okay. in the sense that they have internalized it and believe what they're saying, and would operate their lives on the basis of that. Let, let, let me give you an example. They're not that. No, they're not. A number of years ago, we had the O.J. trial here in California, and if you were watching television in California, m almost all day long, any channel, it would be full of the O.J. trial. It was a big deal. Everybody, that was every, what everybody talked about. And you know, it was whether the gloves fit and all this kind of stuff, you know. And he was finally acquitted. Now, what I've suggested to you is this. When God, if God had been conducting the OJ trial, he would have said, okay, you all sit down here, get yourself comfortable. Let me show you exactly what happened. And he would put the 3D picture on the screen. And everybody would be able to see it. He might even repeat some parts so we, you know, if something happened really fast, repeat some parts so they could see it. And when it was all finished, 15 or 20 minutes, the whole thing was absolutely clear. He would say, does anyone have any questions? And the answer would be no. There, there's just nothing to argue about. There and, it was. And, yeah, no, and nobody challenged the data. No one challenges. That wouldn't drive anybody to kneel to him, though. It would. No, I don't think so. Well, I, well, it's going to be a big, a lot well, of difference between the end of the world and the OJ trial, but it's going to be so dramatic that um, yeah. what 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 God is going to do. Remember that if you read Great Controversy, and I would suggest if you have a chance, if you have that book with you, open it up and read pages. Start about page six sixty four and read through six sixty six, six sixty seven. It talks about the sequence. The New Jerusalem is going to come down from heaven. Satan and his group are going to get ready to attack the city. Just about the time they're ready to attack, they got themselves all organized, they're ready to attack. What happens, the New Jerusalem rises up off the surface of the earth, and above that, even higher, is a throne, way up there, but everybody can see it. And Jesus is crowned as the king, way up there on that throne. And then all of a sudden, the whole sky turns into a, a screen, in effect. And... 3D living color, the great controversy. And when it's all finished, I mean, we know that if you have a very powerful movie, people can be laughing when it's time to laugh and they can be crying when it's time to cry. And it's almost like it's beyond their capacity to, you know, to stop it. You're just moved by that. Just imagine comparison with the very best movie, movie makers that we have, what God can do. Yeah, but isn't that manipulating your your um, emotions? No, no, that's no. what you're that's talking the, about. That's the that's showing what the director of everything. Does. That's there's no manipulation there, right? That's no. the kind of the final. Yeah. Here it is. This is what happened in the world. It's called truth. This is not a show. This truth. is reality. Right. <clears throat> okay, but uh, that's a little different than what you're talking about because oh. because what these guys do with their movie is that. They write the thing. They make you associate things. The music is on there All of at a certain way and everything to, to get you to bring that response. And it's not even true. Well, and but, I, but we're I talking about it. something that, that's true here. Absolutely true. It's going to be so compelling. The whole story is going to be so compelling. And it will be 3D living color. There won't be any argument. There won't be anybody able to argue that any part of it's wrong. They know for sure that that whole story is exactly true. Correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Ellen White someplace say that he doesn't have to say anything? He just looks, mm -hmm. and they all of a sudden see them in their place in the whole controversy. They recognize and they recall every sin that they have ever committed. Ever, ever committed. Right. I mean... That may be a panorama, but the only thing you're seeing is your part. No, I think you're seeing your part in the context of the whole thing. Okay. That'd be yeah. a pretty big context. Yeah. Millions and millions of people. Yep. So that makes me think that it's probably not just a panorama. It's got to be something it's way It's a panorama. That's the that. backdrop. The backdrop is God's panorama. And as your time comes along, you see yourself in that panorama.
You know, we, they, it is said that we only use a per certain part of our brain. Mm -hmm. Maybe God has a way at that time of opening up your whole brain so that you remember mm -hmm. everything. Well, why didn't he do that before? I mean, just get everybody convicted right off instead of going through all this. Back to the great controversy. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have to see that after all of that, we come down here for this final thing, and, and I mean, after they've seen everything, and people have gone to heaven and spent a thousand years, come back, and they're still ready to gang up. And, mm -hmm. and it shows that these people do not <coughs> freely choose to love God. Yeah. No, exactly. And God, so. you only can get to heaven if you freely want to be um, there. And, and want to uh, fit into the structure that's mm -hmm. there. Yeah, so it, this is one of the passages that talks about the nature of Christ up earlier in there. And there are several other passages. Uh, John 1, 1 to 3, we're all familiar with that one. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so forth. And then Colossians 1, 15, we talked about that uh, last time. And Hebrews 1, 1 to 13, I'm just going to read the first couple of passage, first couple of uh, sentences in that one. Uh, that's a, something we're going to be talking about very soon now, uh, coming up in our, but look at Hebrews 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors many times and in many ways through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, or through a son, a divine son. He is the one through whom God created the universe, the one whom God has chosen to possess all things at the end, he reflects the brightness of God's glory and is the exact likeness of God's own being, sustaining the universe with his powerful word. After achieving forgiveness for the sins of all human beings, he sat down in heaven at the right side of God. And of course, the right side is the side of favor, the supreme power. That sounds like a neat thing to tell the guard that you're strapped to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're going to suggest that the book of Hebrews was probably written right after Philippians, <coughs> or about the same time, basically. You know, so if you had, yes. Um, this could have been written for today, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And it says disputing is like more intellectual questioning and criticism. Uh, but you're not supposed to do things with grumbling or disputing, questioning or criticism, intellectual so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God. Um, we are becoming experts on disputing on the internet. Mm -hmm. and, and we dispute, dispute, we question, we criticize, we act intellectual. So that is something we're not supposed to do. I remember, didn't Jesus say, let your conversation be yay, yay, and nay, nay? Yes. Is that so that you wouldn't be caught up in internet arguing? Yes, yes, and no, no. Yes, yes, and no, no. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a place for argument. I don't think so. I am so tired of arguing. Well, you've gone probably a little overboard there with all the <laughs> stuff you've been seeing, but but you know, just like here, we need to we need to ask questions about what somebody gives us to make sure that that you know it jives. With well, that's I think wise. that's different. That's being wise. The idea of argument, I think, embeds in it. I'm going to make my point no matter what. And it, it becomes, how do I make this? Whereas the discussion that you're talking about in a quest for understanding is quite different. I grew up with a relative, and I won't say what relative, um, always liked to argue. And of course, I always stood for truth, justice, in the American way, so I, he knew I would argue. <laughs> Supergirl. Yeah, cool. I, I don't know. But anyway, one time I said, wait a minute, last time you argued this way, why are you saying this now? And he says, well, whatever position you take, I just take the opposite because oh, I like oh, to oh, argue. Oh. And, and that just blew it for me. And it, I realized at that time, some people just love to argue. Mm -hmm. And that is probably what he means here. Yeah. You know. Well, let, let me just give you my summary real quick of, of these verses that are about the the divinity of Christ and his role, so forth. And I tried to put those verses, the John 1, Philippians 2, Colossians 1, and Hebrews 1, together. And these are, this is what I concluded. One, Christ is, has always been, and always will be 
fully God. Two, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are always in full harmony. Christ is the agent through whom all things were created, so he is superior to all created things. We are made in their image. Christ set aside his divinity and became a human being to reach us. Christ had earlier become an angel to reach angels. He was called what? Archangel. Michael, Archangel. the archangel, yes. As sinners, we cannot see God, so Christ came and made himself visible to us to demonstrate the truth about God. From the beginning, Christ voluntarily agreed to take on the role of representing God to his creatures. While doing this, he was still fully God. When he returned to heaven from his time here, he again assumed his position at the right hand of God, and the entire universe worshipped him for what he had done. When the truth of what Christ had accomplished is seen by all, the truth of it will be so compelling that everyone, even Satan temporarily, will bow down and worship Christ once again. And we've already mentioned Isaiah 43, 23, 45, 23. He, Paul, Paul had already talked about this passage once before in Romans 14, 11. Christ is the head of the church and the source of its power and life. By his life and his death, Christ answered all of Satan's accusations and questions and won the great controversy sealing Satan's doom. What Christ has done for us wins us back to even greater loyalty and love than we had at the beginning. Christ offers us full union with him if we will agree to live as he lived. As God, Christ deserves our worship now and forever. And finally, God the Father places Christ in the highest position available because of what he has done. Now, you probably wouldn't word your conclusions exactly like that, but that was my conclusions from reading these passages is quite a, quite a impressive collection of, of statements, uh, modified obviously a little bit from in, what I read in scripture. In that um, part of that, are you saying that God sends a part of himself as Christ to his various um, creations and, mm -hmm. and we're, we're one, we're the one that fell? God reaches out to all his creatures, yes. Mm -hmm. Through yeah. Christ? Mm -hmm. And in well, Romans, I mean, go ahead. certainly the Holy Spirit reaches out to us too. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah. in Christ's physical absence, the Holy Spirit does that too. I mean, every member of the Godhead reaches out to sinful man to try to redeem him. Mm -hmm. Well, Paul has a sort of summary of the gospel found in Philippians chapter 2, starting with verse 12. Um, 12 and 13. See what you think of this summary of the gospel. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, I'm reading from my Good News Bible. So then, dear friends, as you always obeyed me when I was with you, it is even more important that you obey me now while I'm away from you. Keep on working with fear and trembling to complete your salvation because God is always at work in you to make you willing and able to obey his own purpose. Now, it's a little, the, the contrasts are a little bit more evident in the more traditional translation. He says, what are we supposed to do? Keep on working to complete our salvation because what, what's God doing? He's working in us. Well, what's our role and what is God's role in salvation? We're going to have to make this quick because we're running out of time. God does everything. He created us. He it's sustains both to us. to will. He even, he even has to provide the, the desire. Mm -hmm. But thankfully, he's willing to do that. Mm -hmm. If we'll just give up on self and quit trying to do it our, on our own, okay, we let have him to, have it. We have to be willing to receive what he offers. Combine right. our will with his. The way he wants to give is, it. Is that saying we have to be willing to change? Yes. Yes. Big time. Yeah. To, to change from the side of selfishness to the side of love. That's really what that amounts to. So, <coughs> while there's not something that just happens to you, you accept it, why this wonderful little miracle takes over in your heart and you're a different person. I well, think you have to go kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> we, have to, we have to give God the time. <coughs> if our minds are occupied with something else, that God has to say, I'm sorry, I'm waiting here. I'm waiting. But if we're willing to give him some time, he will certainly make use of it. 
and he will come in. The changes that need to happen in our minds, we don't make those changes. God makes those changes. But he cannot make those changes if we're, my, our minds are occupied with something else. Well, but that's kind of scary. And we can't resist if we have friends that say, you're changing. What's happening to you? Mm -hmm. That's kind of scary to give your will over to something else that... You don't know what's going to happen, and you know I read about some of these people in this book that did that, and it wasn't a whole lot of fun for them. Yeah. The only thing is, you're giving your will over to the creator of the universe, someone who created all the flowers, the animals, the. I mean, what better thing to give your will to than than yeah, someone who's that loving and creative? That's true, but when you find yourself stuffed in a log and sawed in two. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul sort of brings this book of his to a conclusion with a couple things. First of all, he really lays into the Judaizers who are trying to tell the Philippians, you know, you got to go back and you got to practice all the Christian, I mean, all the Jewish ceremonies and creating, including circumcision. And Paul says, those dogs, and that's just about the lowest term you can use <laughs> for people in those days. A dog was really, really looked down upon by the Greeks, by the Jews. These were scavenger dogs in the streets and, and he and then Paul says those famous words that come in, in chapter 4. We should look at those for a moment. Look at Philippians chapter 4 and starting, well, basic, basically verse 8. In conclusion, my friends, fill your minds with those things that are, that are good, that deserve praise, things that are true, noble, right, pure, lovely, and honorable. Put into practice what you learn to receive from me, both from my words and my actions, and the God who gives us peace will be with you. So, in the book of Philippians, what did we learn about God? He wants to Paul help was us. very thankful. We should be thankful. Paul was in prison. He didn't lose hope. Um, he had written letters to several other churches. This was certainly not his first letter. He... he um, what role did God have in, in the writing of this letter? Did God inspire Paul to write this letter? We think so. Did God inspire the Philippians to send Paul money? Probably so. Uh, and so many things, like you to think about it. Read the book of Philippians over again and ask yourself, what role did God have in this book? See you next week.